Right, so as I said, five minute summary then of everything we've seen. Okay. So, we started the course by talking about what came before special relativity. Okay. Um, so we talked about experiments to measure the speed of light. Okay. So how is the speed of light measured? And then we talked about the early theories which described what light was. And in particular, we talked about the ether theory. So this is the idea that light is a, a wave-like excitation of a certain medium, which is known as the ether. But we saw that there were some problems with this. Okay, so the ether theory failed for various reasons. And in particular, we looked at two experiments which showed some of these problems. So the first was the Michelson-Morley experiment, okay, which failed to detect the ether velocity on Earth. And the second one we talked about was aberration experiments. Um, which is the apparent shift in the position of light from stars as the Earth changes its velocity. Okay? And it's very difficult to make an ether theory which is consistent with all of these different experimental observations. Okay? So then we came to the special theory of relativity, which was based upon two ideas, which we call the postulates of the theory. Okay. So the first postulate was that speed of light was a constant. So I won't write the whole thing, but basically any inertial observers who do experiments to measure the speed of light in a vacuum will always get the same result. Okay. No matter how fast you are moving, light always goes past you at the same speed. That's the first postulate. And the second postulate is this principle of relativity. Which basically says that there's no absolute sense of speed. Okay. So you, if you do an experiment in what you think is stationary, and you do an experiment moving at a constant velocity, then those experiments give the same results. Okay. So there's a symmetry between observers with different constant velocities. So that was that. Um, so some consequences of this. So the first thing is that you must reject the Galilean transformation. So no, like the Galilean transformation, which is the, the, the simple one, you know, if I'm moving at 10 meters per second and you're moving at 5 meters per second, then the relative speed between us is 5 meters per second, right? The idea that you can just simply you know, add velocities like this, this is not true. And it can't be true if these postulates are true. Right? So you must reject that. So then what is the correct transformation, and we found the correct transformation was the Lorentz transformation. Okay. Which, at small velocities, is approximately the same as the Galilean transformation, which it should be because we know at small velocities, less than, much less than the speed of light, Newtonian physics is, is basically right. Okay. So it has the correct limit, so we saw the Lorentz transformation. The Lorentz transformation. All right, I don't know, you can't see it, so let me continue up here. So the Lorentz transformation has um, some consequences for the way we measure space and time, and in particular, measurements of space intervals and time intervals are no longer absolute. Okay, so different observers have different ideas of length and time. Okay, and we summarize these into three effects which were length contraction, time dilation, and relative simultaneity. Okay. 
So these are all effects which describe the difference in space and time measurements between different observers, right, with different velocities. And we did some, you know, talked about some experiments that can give evidence of this, talked about some of the effects of these, some of the consequences of these effects. Right? So, for example, we talked about the relativistic Doppler effect. We looked at velocity transformations. How does velocity transform in special relativity? And then finally, what we've done in the last week is look at the consequences for Newtonian physics. Okay? So, the last thing we did is that Newtonian physics is not compatible with special relativity. Okay? And in particular, we looked at the case of momentum, and we showed that Newtonian momentum is, the conservation of Newtonian momentum is disagreed upon. Different observers think different things. Right? One observer thinks it is conserved, the other one thinks it's not. Right? So, so it's no good. Okay? Um, so we have to come up with some, some new laws to correct Newtonian physics. And for particular momentum, the thing that you must change is the definition of momentum. Okay, and we saw how we should change it. I won't write out the equation again, just to save time. So how do we need to change Newton's laws to make them compat compatible with special relativity? <coughs> and from here, we saw that the new definition of momentum also had some consequences. Okay? So, we saw that there's this new time component of momentum, which you can consider as the total energy divided by C. And we also saw this equation that the change in mass of an object, so the mass of an object changes when its energy changes. So that, that, I think, is more or less a complete summary of everything we've done. So first of all, why do we need special relativity? Yeah, and that was because there were problems with the understanding of the behavior of light. What are the consequences of special relativity? So the things like Lorentz transformation, these effects here. And then finally, how do we have to modify Newtonian physics in order to make it compatible with the new transformations of space and time? Okay. And that leads to relativistic momentum and these predictions here.